Joint seminar has been a wonderful occasion for learning from one another. And as we do so, we learn that we have much in common. We are all baptized into one church. We all seek to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And we all read the same scriptures, whether we are from Chicago or Hyderabad, from the United States of America or from India. But we also discover, as we have worked together, as we have learned together, that we live in very different contexts, that we face different challenges, and that we bring different lenses to the reading of scripture. Last Thursday, during our joint session here at ACTC, Dr. Matthew Tatapuri gave us a very stimulating lecture in which he proposed attention to the theme of conflict. Conflict as a key to understanding the scripture. And he explained to us how conflict is present everywhere in the world, but all through the scripture, and how the scriptural stories of conflict provide resources for all who seek justice, for all who refuse to accept situations and structures of oppression simply as they are. This was very helpful to us, to be reminded that the church faces different challenges in different places, and because of that, we seek different keys to open up the scriptures, to seek guidance in our particular situations. What I want to share with you this evening is rather different, partly because it comes from a different cultural context different cultural context with a different set of challenges. For the past several years, I have been asking questions like this. What scriptural resources may we find to help U.S. American Christians? Christians in the USA. What scriptural resources can we find to help these North American Christians think about the challenge of living with religious diversity? Now, this is something for which we have much less experience than Christians in India. Christians in India have a great deal of experience in living with religious diversity. We in North America do not have so much experience. And so we have to ask questions such as, how can we live with this diversity? How can we allow people to be different, to treat them with respect, to create friendships with people coming from other faith traditions? and to work together for the well-being of our communities. These are North American challenges, and they are challenges that have become sharper in recent years. When I was a child, to be religious in the United States of America was to be either Protestant or Catholic or Jewish. One of those three. But the context has changed. Changes in US immigration laws in 1965 and many subsequent developments have brought Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and many others to the United States. Some Christians have reacted to these developments with indifference but some have reacted with fear. What we call Islamophobia, fear of Islam, 
was a reality in America already before September 11, 2001. But obviously since then, this phenomenon of Islamophobia, fear of Islam, has just grown uh, greatly. And so again, our challenge as Christians is what might be a U.S. American Christian approach to scripture that will help us to face this particular challenge. How shall we live with our neighbors of other faiths? My reflections now fall into three categories, or we might say three scriptural resources that may help us, and again, I'm thinking especially of North, the North American context. And I must say, I'm going to be very, very interested in your reactions. I'm going to be sharing with you things that I have shared with North American Christians. I want to know, do they make any sense in this context? Are they helpful in this context? No. I'm looking forward to the discussion. And so, what I'm interested in is how can we develop a Christian imagination that will allow us to live with the reality of religious diversity and do so in a respectful and hopeful way. And my proposal is this. Here are three points. I want to say that this kind of Christian imagination, first, possesses eschatological horizons. Or to put it another way, Christians are called to be people of vision. To be people of vision. Second, this Christian imagination is shaped by the scripture and shaped by the scripture in such a way that we become a people that pays attention. So number one, people of vision. Number two, a people that pays attention. And then number three, a Christian imagination that can deal with the challenges of religious diversity is one that is lived, tested, and made concrete in the practices of the church and particularly the practice of hospitality. That is, we are called to be a people of hospitality. Okay, so those three points, to be a people of vision, to be a people that pays attention, to be a people of hospitality. So number one, this is the eschatological division. The first of the three resources that I mentioned has to do with the revival in recent years of the theme of eschatology in Christian theology. Eschatology is speech about the last things, not in the sense of seeking to create a timetable in advance for the end of days, as some people try to do from the symbolic figures in the book of Revelation and elsewhere in the Bible, but rather speech about the last things as understanding history as being gathered by God and heading to a goal, to a final consummation where finally God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Eschatological thinking allows us to say, we are not yet what we will be. We are not yet what God will make of us. Our religious traditions are not yet what they will be. God still has surprises in store for us. And some of these surprises might have to do with what God will make 
of our present religious diversity. A biblical illustration of this comes from the book of Revelation. Not from the apocalyptic visions, not the visions of locusts or the seven-headed dragon or the beast whose number is 666 or Gog and Magog, but rather from chapter 7, where we encounter a great multitude gathered in heaven about the throne of God, singing, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. The text stresses the point that the multitude, which is so great that no one can count it, is from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Here and throughout the scriptures, the vision of the climax of history, the consummation of all things, is a vision that incorporates difference every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages, from east and west, north and south. Now, this text in Revelation chapter 7 does not explicitly help us with religious diversity. How precisely God is going to deal with that, I don't think we know. But, the revival of eschatology as central to Christian theology has helped to create room in the Christian imagination for a positive engagement with the world's religious diversity. We are not yet what God will make of us, and God's Spirit is ever calling us beyond ourselves, and in that very fact, there is room for interaction, for dialogue, for change, and for what the Qur'an calls competing or vying with one another in goodness. That's in Surah 5, verse 48. So, we are called to be people of vision. Next, a second resource that is helping Christians to make room in their imaginations for people outside the Christian community, outside the tightly knit community, is the many stories in the Bible in which strangers, people from outside the familiar community, come and very surprisingly take a leading role. I call them outsider stories, stories about strangers. I think some of these stories spring to mind immediately. Think, for example, of Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, in which it is the Samaritan, a religiously, ethnically, and politically suspect outsider, someone frequently hated Judea. It is that Samaritan who proves neighbor to the man who had been assaulted on the road to Jericho. And we can read all of these Samaritan stories in the New Testament in the same way. It's the good Samaritan is the stranger who brings help. Think of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. The Samaritan woman, remember, gives to Jesus to drink. Jesus is on the road. He's thirsty. He asks for her hospitality. But what strikes me about the story of the Samaritan woman is that a conversation ensues in John chapter 4 between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. In a sense, they have a kind of interfaith dialogue the woman responds to Jesus and continues to respond to Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 4, the woman has seven lines. If you look back just one chapter to John chapter 3, 
there, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews, he has a conversation with Jesus, but he only has three lines. And the third line is only, how can these things be? The Samaritan woman, she hangs in there in the conversation with Jesus. They talk about their faiths. They compare the faith of the Jews and the Samaritans. And eventually, at the end of the conversation, they come to deeper things to talk about worship in spirit and in truth. It's a model for interfaith dialogue. It's a dialogue with a very surprising character with this Samaritan woman. We can find many examples like this in the Bible. I'd like to go back to the Old Testament. My former colleague at Luther Seminary, the Reverend Dr. Terry Fretton, has written a book about Abraham. And he pays careful attention to Abraham's encounters with people we might call outsiders and points out how frequently it is those outsiders who bring blessing, it, or it is the outsiders who speak the word of truth. I'll give two examples. One example is in Genesis chapter 14 the story about the mysterious Melchizedek. In Genesis chapter 14, we read that Abraham, or rather his name is still Abram at this point in the narrative, had conducted a successful military campaign against an alliance of four kings and had brought the goods and captives that they had taken from Sodom and Gomorrah including Abram's nephew, Lot. Upon Abram's return, we read, King Melchizedek of Salem, who, by the way, hadn't been mentioned up to this point in the book of Genesis, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High, El Elyon. Again, a name God, we hadn't heard about so far. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by El Elyon, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be El Elyon who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram accepted the blessing, gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything, and refused to keep any of the spoils for himself saying to the king of Sodom, and using a very surprising combination of divine names, Abraham said, I have sworn to the Lord, it's the divine name, Yahweh, God most high, that's El Elyon, the name that Melchizedek had used, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything is yours. This is an exceedingly mysterious figure, this Melchizedek, a Canaanite priest king who enters the narrative completely unannounced. He blesses Abram in the name of Elion, God Most High, an unfamiliar name. But Melchizedek characterizes this Elion as maker of heaven earth, and Abraham accepts the blessing. Not only that, he regards this name, El Elyon, as unproblematic, and makes use of it himself as suitable to be in acquisition of the name of the Lord. And Abram seems to have learned something from the encounter. He learned that the victory was God's doing, not his own with the consequence that he should not take any personal profit from a victory. Abram learns from the mysterious outsider and changes his behavior accordingly. Abram accepted blessing in 
an unfamiliar name of God. This strikes me as 